Thanks, Terry. Um, let's just make sure I've got this working OK. Um, one of the most significant activities that the Australian Institute of Marine Science undertakes is long-term ecosystem monitoring. And, and the reason we undertake this type of work is in order to be able to provide the managers and policy makers who are responsible for the Great Barrier Reef with the kind of evidence they need to determine whether there are threats occurring and to provide them with um, information on how they might be able to ameliorate those threats through management activities. Now, the, um, we also use monitoring and, and, and undertake monitoring in order to be able to understand how ecosystems process and better predict you know, how ecosystems will, will, will um, react in the future to a variety of impacts. But the primary reason why we've developed these monitoring programs and got funded for it is simply to provide this immediate advice back to managers so that they can you know, make the best decisions in terms of um, regulating use. Um, the original monitoring programs on the Great Barrier Reef uh, undertaken by Ames uh, were really oriented around a very specific problem. In fact, it was almost certainly uh, in, uh, the crown of thorn starfish which allowed us to find the funding to be able to go out there and do synoptic monitoring of the Great Barrier Reef using mantitoes. Later on, we added on to this with other programs. But um, as a result of the, the fact that there has been shifting um, issues facing the Great Barrier Reef, the, the kind of um, information that is required of monitoring programs has shifted through time. And this has required a change in the monitoring programs and in the, um, the types of sampling uh, and, and observations that we're doing. Now, as a result of that, what we've got now is within Ames even, and this is not taking into account other monitoring programs, several monitoring programs that have slightly different objectives that uh, report, in fact, somewhat independently. And one of the things I wanted to do was try to briefly bring the three of the monitoring programs that we do on the Great Barrier Reef within Ames and show how we need to be looking at these together in order to be able to get a good accurate picture of what's going on and provide managers with information that they need in terms of understanding what the key threats are and how they might be ameliorated. So um, basically, the, the most important, the, lo the longest term monitoring program, which we've just recently reported on, is broad scale surveys, Mantito surveys carried out over the last 27 years on a total of 487 reefs overall, about 100 per year. And uh, on top of that, and so you can see that they're, they're, they're uh, covering almost the entire Great Barrier Reef from the far north to the south. But on top of that, we also do detailed transect surveys on about 47 reefs uh, per year, every year, and another 46 reefs every second year to monitor the effects of zoning, in fact. On, so those are two, two different projects, programs with very different um, uh, objectives in terms of being able to do broad scale surveys of, of the reef perimeters, and um, one which is looking at detailed um, impacts on specific parts of the reef, just small transects on the northeast corners of coral reefs. The third project, is, is much more focused on another issue, which is the issue of land use and water quality and terrestrial runoff. And here we've got a number of different sampling sites on very inshore coral reefs up and down the, the middle of the Great Barrier Reef in different um, catchments. And, and there we're again monitoring corals, but with a very different objective and, and clearly very different environments that we're monitoring in them. And there's about 35 reefs that we've been monitoring only since 2005. So that's the, um, that's the background of the three programs. I'd like to at least discuss what we're finding um, um, about. But th the point here is that I think you know, the, the general point of this talk is that these different programs measure different things and reveal different impacts. Um, and that overall, the summary data that we often get from these projects, which are actually sampling at a very large number of sites over time and produce very complicated data, and do require summarization, they provide a simple story which managers need, but on the other hand, they hide a variety of complex stories that are also very important for local management and, and also hide in important spatial effects and impacts. And, and we need to think about how we actually integrate a lot of these results in terms of being able to provide a, a simple but accurate and useful picture to managers as we go forward. So what I'd like to talk about first is, the, is the, um, the longest monitoring program that we have on the Great Barrier Reef, the broad-scale surveys, Mantitos, 
Um, we've been doing these surveys uh, for 27 years and recently published a, a paper by Glenn Diath and, and co-authors um, that um, documented the overall trend of corals over those 27 years. And I think a lot of people are very familiar with this now. It's shown that over 27 years there's been about a 50% decline in coral cover over the entire Great Barrier Reef. Now that's a nice simple result, a sim fairly simple curve showing sort of a, a, a dip here but an ongoing decline. What we then did was to, um, and when I say we, I have to, to admit this is really all the, all the scientists that have been involved in the various monitoring programs and, and plus the, the authors. Um, the, we looked at the, 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 the three major factors which we believe influence coral cover, especially on these reefs that tend to be on the outer edge of the reef and, and into the midter, inner matrix. And they were crown of thorns, starfish, and cyclones, crown of thorns, starfish, cyclones, and coral bleaching. And they were the, basically the only three data sets we had which matched the long-term data that we have on, on, the, um, on the Great Barrier Reef so that we could actually correlate it with the full data set. Now, what we found was that if you put those three variables in and look at how much they can be, um, uh, how much of the variation of the decline they can account for, the, the proportional contribution was that um, cyclones accounted for about 48% of the overall decline, cots 42% and bleaching 10%. Now this was an interesting result because not only did it show that there was a really alarming decline, this has been uh, highlighted in a number of previous studies, but this is the longest, most comprehensive study to really definitively show this decline. And it also highlighted the importance of crown of thorn starfish as a major uh, factor influencing this decline. And as a result, managers have, 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 have expressed a renewed interest in um, controls of crown of thorn starfish, and the government has been investing in that. Now, there were other factors that probably were um, definitely affecting this decline. We didn't have the long-term data sets to put them into the analysis, so they didn't appear in this paper. There's a bit of a concern here, and that this is a really nice, simple picture. It raises concern, which we want to do, and it shows that there's some really important factors which are influencing coral, uh, coral cover and, and uh, having impacts on the reef, which we again want to address. But I feel that we may have been a vic victim of our own success because this received a great deal of attention. And as a result, there's now a huge focus on crown of thorn starfish. And, and I think one of the important messages out of this talk is that the other monitoring programs we've got, which are actually looking at different parts of the reef for different reasons and, and using different methods, are showing a richer uh, pattern of what's causing these um, stresses on coral reefs generally. And we need to take these into account rather than just focusing on those three. Um, the, uh, one of the things I want to show here is that, the, uh, first of all, the fact that while there's a very simple overall decline in the, in the general pattern, you can see here there's an enormous amount of variation in the data that if you look at it spatially, it shows that it's not happening, you know, the, the, the pattern is not the same over the entire Jet Great Barrier Reef. Overall, coral cover is very low during that entire study period in the center, much higher in the south, but actually declining quite quickly, and in the north, stable and much higher. And if you look at, again, just to show you that there's in fact a whole wealth of individual stories from the trajectories of each of the reefs that we're studying, which again, potentially are very interesting to managers who are looking at, looking at trying to manage the local environment, but it's very difficult to tell a story out of that. We can dissect the overall trend by looking at least in the, in the um, uh, dissecting the GBR trend in the north, center, and south, and here what we can find is that basically in the north, uh, the reefs didn't show any major decline. They sort of wobbled up and down a bit, but they were still maintained a fairly high coral cover. In the central and southern reefs, there was actually quite a, a, a strong decline, a very strong bimodal decline in the center, uh, and more of a, of a major decline at the end of the period in the south. And, and again, cyclones that have been traveling up and down the reef um, are, 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 are seen to be a, a major factor in, in all of this. Um, but looking at the exact effects of cyclones and the recovery may require a different monitoring program to, to, to tease that issue apart. Um, but in the southern reefs in particular, this really significant decline is probably due just to as, as a result of two very severe cyclones that happened uh, near the end of this sampling period. So um, the other major factor that we found in terms of this overall uh, sort of uh, long-term study was that crown of thorn starfish was causing a great deal of, of the, of the uh, uh, 
decline. And what we have been able to do is go out and do some further surveys here to determine to what extent this is an ongoing problem. And what we found is that, in fact, with the more recent results, we can see very clearly that there's some outbreaks up in the Cook down to Lizard Island section, which actually are representing probably the highest density of, of crown of thorns that we've seen in this region since uh, 1985, and that this is likely to be the, the beginning of a third wave of crown of thorns outbreaks uh, as we go forward. Um, clearly, we can see in terms of just overall densities in the GBR, there's been two major waves, and we believe this is the, the harbinger of a, of a third wave overall um, in the next few years. Um, I'd like to now move on to the second uh, of the monitoring programs, which is the, the line transects, fixed transects on, on the northeast corners of reefs. First of all, what do we see in terms of the overall patterns? If you do the average of the whole Great Barrier Reef, here's the overall pattern that we saw in the Manta toes, um, slightly, slightly rescaled. And what do we see in, in, the, in the video or the fixed uh, photographs, photograph transects? We see the overall decline in the previous you know, sort of uh, 10 or so years is very much matched uh, from, from between the Matato and, and the, um, the videos or the fixed transect, but they started off from a much lower area. So overall, the, the overall decline during that particular period for fixed transects isn't, isn't particularly evident compared to what we've seen from the overall Matatoes, but we're seeing fairly similar kinds of trends near the end of that. And, and, and therefore, I think what we're, we're, we're seeing is, is a reasonable congruence between, between those two patterns. If we dissect those up again, what I wanted to highlight is that there is an enormous uh, complexity of data in terms of the stories for each reefs. But as a result of some of the work by um, uh, Kate Osborne uh, that was published uh, a few years ago, we, she was able to look at the, the various factors which were believed to be influencing those individual reefs and, and attribute some of the, the differences to those factors and then look at how much they contributed overall to the, over, to the decline. And what's interesting is, again, kind of throwing starfish and cyclones were the two major factors. But here what we're seeing is clearly there are a number of other factors, including diseases which are coming up, which we didn't see in the overall story from the previous um, Matiso analysis. In the fixed transects, you can see disease corals. You can't see disease corals particularly well from a Matito. So it is important to be able to have these kinds of detailed studies on top of the, the broad sail surveys to be able to tease out some of the, the other key impacts that are occurring on the Great Barrier Reef. Um, and again, if we look at the crown of thorn starfish, by, by looking at more detailed long-term monitoring uh, of, of fixed transects, we're able to actually look at some of the, uh, the, the impacts in more, more detail. And what we can see here, this is possibly a bit out of focus, is that if you identify some reefs which were impacted by, by, crown of thorn, by the cyclones and some that weren't, you can clearly see the, the impact that's being made, the, the actual magnitude of the impact compared to some reefs which were not um, in, in the path of the cyclone. Similarly, we can look at the uh, individuals, uh, smaller individuals and in some reefs in, in areas that have been impacted and look at the rates of recovery and be able to d document that, in fact, for, for cyclones, there is very good scope for recovery on many of the reefs that are being badly affected, as long as other things, um, other impacts aren't also uh, impacting on these reefs. Now, the third monitoring program that I wanted to uh, talk about, which again gives you a very different perspective on where, um, where the reef is going and what's affecting it, is the water quality and inshore coral reef monitoring program done as part of the reef rescue package. Now here, as I said before, rather than monitoring the reefs uh, near the, the, uh, in, in the matrix, uh, um, we're looking at the really inshore fringing reefs in each of these catchments here, very turbid water. And, and monitoring a variety of water quality parameters as well as uh, corals and, and, and recruitment and, and also forearm index. If we look at the overall results from this study, which is not nearly as long term, but still is beginning to accumulate a, a good set of data and has been now you know, included in the, in the, the reef um, report um, recently, what we're finding is in terms of water quality and these are indicators, not actual values, is that the overall condition in terms of water quality is showing a, a decline in most of, the, most of the catchments. And similarly, in terms of the coral condition, um, we're seeing, again, a decline. That's a decline in, in cover as well as juvenile corals. Uh, and that, again, shows that what we're seeing is the message we're giving overall to managers 
of a decline in corals on the Great Barrier Reef is consistent across all these three programs. But what's interesting is in this case, I think some of the more detailed work that we've been able to do on one part, one area, where we have a bit of a longer record, is showing that the, the, the drivers of this change are very different again, and we have to keep this in, in mind. So if we look at simply the area around the Whitsundays and look at the, um, the, the, the river outflows, what we can see is that um, between 2002 and 2006, there was generally very low discharges, low rainfall, low, low freshwater discharges, whereas there's, that's been succeeded by a period of very, very wet years that has very much driven um, the results that we've seen in, in the most recent uh, nearshore monitoring. And if you look at the gray line versus the black line in each of these two, you can see that in the, in the wet years, you get a decrease in the actual suspended solid, solids and, 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 um, and chlorophylls Oh, sorry, in the dry years, you get an increase in the suspended solids during the wet years and an increase in chlorophyll during the wet years. So there's a big difference in water quality between this series of wet years and dry years. And if you look now at the actual number of juvenile corals and coral cover, what you can find is that, again, between these wet years and the dry years, that there's been, in particular, and for juvenile corals, a decrease from the initial years just during the end of this dry cycle into the wet, wet cycle. You're seeing a decline in the number of juvenile corals, not so much in terms of coral cover, but also a decline, a, a change in the species abundances as a result of corals having to adapt to more turbid conditions. And this is particularly evident in the, in the deeper sites um, in, in this area. The other thing that the, um, the, this uh, study has shown is that, in fact, disease, um, while it doesn't show any huge trend during this period, during the first couple of years when, when the, the, the change from this dry period to the wet period occurred, there was quite a, a significant increase in disease, especially in 2007 with some very high outliers, that seems to indicate that this change in water quality has driven not only a change in the number of juveniles, which potentially will, will change coral cover down the track, but also the, the incidence of disease. This actually represents the first time that um, we've been able to show a, a direct effect of water quality on, on coral communities in this kind of uh, direct observational sense. So overall, what I want to conclude from all of this is that we've looked at now, in a sense, just from the AIMS long-term monitoring programs, um, there are multiple lines of evidence to suggest that there's a, a general decline in coral cover on the GBR, both inshore and offshore. But the different programs implicate different sets of causal factors. For instance, water quality is, is just as important in this decline, but it operates much more, and this is fairly obvious, in the inshore reefs, whereas chronothorn starfish and to a lesser extent cyclones are, 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 are um, factors that operate in the, in the offshore reefs, and they show up in the mantitoes and the video transects much more. Um, so the general trends uh, also that we've been using to communicate to managers are very evocative. They're very convincing, and they, they do address some genuine concerns that the managers ought to have and that we as scientists should have, but they are very simplistic, and we do need to be mindful of the fact that it is important to dissect these curves out into individual stories that play out in different spatial areas and that we need to be able to communicate this as well so that we don't have one solution fits the entire reef management approaches. Um, so the other thing is, is, is there would be, the other thing that I'd like to say is that I think that as a result of the fact that there are, at least within AIMS, three different monitoring efforts and a number of other monitoring efforts for different organisms and things like that in other institutions, and within AIMS there's even a fish monitoring program, which I haven't had the chance to tell you the story about, um, we really need to make sure that when we're communicating where, what's going on to managers that we're really integrating all these studies rather than just reporting on them separately and expecting managers to piece the, the different stories together and integrate them. And, and really, and, and there's a number of other programs, for instance, seagrasses, fish, deep reefs, volunteer monitoring, all of which is reporting on the status of the GBR. We should be, as a community, ensuring that we're giving managers a single coherent story about what's going on rather than allowing different, different studies to report in different ways. Um, and this whole idea of integrating these monitoring programs fits very, very strongly into the notion that, uh, that uh, has been raised within a, uh, one of the strategic assessment uh, programs 
uh, or one of the programs to support the, the strategic assessment for the Great Barrier Reef, which is the development of an integrated monitoring framework for the Great Barrier Reef World Heritage Area. And I think moving forward, it's going to be very important that this kind of integration does occur so that we can really ensure that we're producing a single coherent story that takes in all the various lines of evidence and produces the best advice to the managers going forward. Thanks. Thank you.